All right, let me go ahead and read this here. Um, This is Jonah, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, Nineveh was an extremely large city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days, Nineveh will be demolished. The men of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh, and it said this, By order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both man and beast must be covered in sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from the violence he is doing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Then it says, God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together over our time here studying God's word, that he would intercede on our behalf and speak to our very hearts. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time for this place that we can come and come into contact with your truth. We ask God for your intervention because we know, God, that it's only through you uh, that we understand that we are given uh, insight or wisdom. It's only through your intervention, God. And so we pray for that intervention here. Have your way in this time. May this be a, a, a moment both in the space and in our hearts where you are glorified and where your will is done. Jesus, we turn this time over to you and for your purpose and your name. Amen. All right, have a seat. All right. So just by way of reminder, and you guys probably don't need this reminder every week. I feel like I need it. Um, by, way, by way of reminder, we're doing this series called Revive, and it's a study, as, as Kimon mentioned, it's a study on revival. It's a study on uh, reawakening, rejuvenation. It's a study about renewal. And I was thinking about this, like, it's a great series to do during the spring, right? So there's reminders of this. Almost every time you look out the window these days, it's just reminders of new life coming out and, and flowers and leaves springing out and all this stuff. And it's just like all these great illustrations, images of, of revival, right? Of, of life around us kind of a reawakening. When I first started, I will say though, when I first started preparing for this series, when I was doing kind of the study for it, when I was thinking it through, uh, that was a few months ago. And uh, there wasn't quite as much natural inspiration amount around at that time. Like, if you, if you dare to cast your mind back to what Vermont looked like a few months ago, it was mud season. Things in Vermont were going from looking cold and dead to looking wet and dead. <laughs> but I'm here, like, in my study trying to, like, okay, I've got to think about new life. I've got to think about... Um, revival. I got to think about being made new. And so I did what good millennials do, and I looked on the internet. And man, you guys, there's a lot of information on the internet. There's so much to find. I got so many answers. In fact, the first of the, like, the first I just want to share, first of the few titles I got back when I looked up, like, Christian Revival. I'm looking this up. Uh, online. And here are a few, just a few titles in no particular order. Um, the first one, here are four steps required for revival. Okay, interesting. Next title down was, these six things must happen to bring about revival. The next one down was, what are the seven steps we need for revival? <laughs> 
I'm like, I got to stop reading because it's going to get to like 20 or 30 steps pretty soon and I don't want to go down that road. I stopped, but I did. I kind of stopped at that point. I thought, I'm not really sure that this is the right place for me to be doing this research. And they couldn't even agree on how many steps there were required, whatever it means, required for revival to happen. They couldn't agree on how many there were, let alone on what those steps are. So I closed my computer and I began to search through God's word, which I'll confess I probably should have done first. So often we leave this kind of stuff to guesswork. I'm like, I, th- I think this is what this might look like. I think this is what revival might look like. And we, we have no business doing that. God's provided us with a book. Like he's given us the textbook for it. He's given us the information we need. All we got to do is look here. One of the first places I turned to, because I, I'm not sure what this says about what the Lord is trying to tell me or, or what, but one of the first places I turned to, or my Bible just kind of falls open to, is the book of Jonah. Again, I don't, I don't know what that means, but if you just like kind of let my Bible fall open, Jonah's right there. Jonah's a guy eaten by a fish. You know this? You know this about Jonah? He was eaten by a fish. It kind of amazing, actually. It kind of amazing. Like a lot of people know that he was eaten by a fish, but what's incredible about that is that that's not the end of his story. Like that happens in chapter two of Jonah, and yet there's a Jonah chapter 3, which is incredible when you stop and think about it. The fact that there is a Jonah 3 and 4 at all is an incredible. I was watching this movie with a friend of mine uh, a little while ago, and the hero of this movie is like a silly, fun action movie, and the main guy, he gets hit by, we were trying to count how many cars he got hit by, and we lost track at like 7. And he was just running through, and he's fighting the bad guys, he gets hit by a car, and he jumps up, and he keeps fighting the bad guys. He gets hit by another car, and he jumps up, and he's fighting the bad guys. And it just goes on and on, and at some point we're like, man, what, what's it going to take to stop this guy? It, like, literally cannot be stopped. He falls off a building. He can't be stopped. And I think this is Jonah. Like, this guy is abandoned in the middle of the ocean, and then a fish comes up and swallows him, and you're like, that's the end of Jonah's story. No, no, no. That's not what it takes to stop him. But we're skipping ahead from that part. We're not even going to talk about that part. We're skipping ahead from that. Jonah chapter 3. This is after the fish incident. We read it a few minutes ago. God tells Jonah again, he's already told him this once, but he tells him again, all right, I mean it this time, go to the city of Nineveh and share with them the message that I give you. I want to sit down and uh, just think about that with you a little bit here because what we see in Jonah at this point is something that I believe, and you'll see, is mirrored in Scripture when you see stories of revival. When you look in, in, in Scripture at stories where revival is happening in individuals or in people, this, you're going to see some things here in Jonah you'll see in other places. Often, when we see revival beginning in a situation or in people, it's because of uh, several things. And one of them is here, is that uh, messengers surrender to the message they've heard. So in your, like, if you were to think about, like, if you were to like, think of notes here, this is, the first, this is the first point I would make to you. When messengers surrender to the message they've heard. Hold on to that. Oftentimes revival happens in Scripture it's because when the people who are actually carrying the message, when the people who are carrying words that they've heard actually surrender to that message, actually submit to it. Look at it in our text here. What does it look like? You can see it. If, if you and I dare to look at Jonah and use him as an example for us, we can see it here. He received this message in chapter 3. He surrenders to it. Check it out. First, let's, let's put that up here, uh, Gabby. The first thing you see is, he, is God tells him what? Get up, right? Uh, he's, 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 for those of you who don't know, he's literally been vomited up on the beach at this point. And God says, all right, get up. You're sedentary. You're not moving. It's time to get up. In Hebrew, it's actually one word. It's like arise. Get up. And Jonah had to, and I want to make sure that we kind of understand this. Jonah had to surrender to this message. He didn't want to do what he was getting ready to be asked to do. It was not in his heart. It wasn't his passion. He, he had to choose to take what he wanted and surrender it to the message he was receiving. He's been avoiding this message for some time now. He literally has ran away from it. Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites. He didn't have compassion for the Ninevites. He couldn't care whether they lived or died. He wasn't feeling it. He wasn't like chomping at the bit, the, the bit like, oh, God, send me on missions, please. 
He didn't have any passion for missions or love for the lost, but he got the message. And the catalyst to the revival that happens in this story is when the messenger surrenders to the message he's heard. He doesn't want to get up, but that's the message he's heard. Let me say it this way. For the follower of God, getting up does not come from how you feel. It can't come from how you feel. It comes from who you follow. For the follower of God, getting up and going, it doesn't come from how you feel. It never comes from how you feel. It comes from who you follow. And so it's not often easy. And so it's not often convenient. And it's not actually often what you want to do. But the decision to get up doesn't come from us. It comes to us. It's part of a relationship with God. This is how God talks to you and to me. The same message, Christian, that set you free also turns you loose. So get up, Jonah, God says, not because of who you are, but because of who God is. Get up, Jonah, not because you're uh, uh, able, but because God is able. Get up, Jonah, not because you have compassion for the lost, but because God's compassion has been shared with you. Every Sunday, you and I, we come here and we're reminded that God has saved us. Every Sunday we come here and we're invited to be uh, set free and redeemed into life with the Lord. Every Sunday we come here and we're reminded, you don't have to despair. There is eternal hope available to you. Every Sunday we receive that message, and that message is then, get up. You cannot sit still. The same message that says you don't have to despair also says you cannot sit still. So Jonah gets up, the messenger here in Jonah 3, surrendering to the message he received. But there's more. The next thing is you go down. The next thing there is bolded. He says, get up. And then he says what? Go to the great city of Nineveh. So get up and then go. Go to it, actually. That's important. Go to the city. And, and I actually think that is important. Because if you think about this, going to something is different than just going. If I told my kids, we're, and we're not, but if I told my kids we're going to Disneyland and then we just went to the parking lot and looked at it, well, that would be pretty disappointing, right? Hey, we're here. Look. Now we're going home. So when God says go to Nineveh, Jonah isn't set free to like go and stand outside the city and be like, okay, everyone, listen to this. He's got to go. He's got to go in. Go to the city, which means go intersect with the people in an undeniable way. Walk the streets, be heard by people, interact with people. Paul says in Romans 10, 14, how can people believe in a hope that they have never heard? And the only way they can hear is when we go and share. This is a message that followers of God either submit to or we ignore. This is a message that that the messengers either submit to or we ignore. Submitting to the message is a step toward revival. It's a submission. It's a sacrifice. Often we're in the same place as Jonah, angry at people. Maybe you've never really felt like going to people is your thing. Somebody might have to do a little intercessory prayer over this. Okay. What was I talking about? Oh, you might not feel, in fact, I bet most of us think this, where you think going to people, going to unsaved, going to unchurched people, that's not really my thing. I'll leave that for missionaries. I'll leave that for people who are called to go out and and preach and share in the world. Oftentimes, we're in the same place as Jonah. I don't want to do it. Maybe I don't particularly like people in the first place. Maybe talking in public is not really your thing. Maybe sharing your faith is never really something you've done very often. Or maybe you're like, I'll I'll get to it eventually when I'm at a better place in my life. The fact of the matter is, and listen to this, Christian, if Jesus is your Lord, then you will never be more sent than you are right now in this moment. You will never be more sent than you already have been. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've already been sent. Being sent 
being sent to go to the people. It's not a function of where you are or how you feel. It's not a function of your personality or your passions. It's not a result of the place you're at emotionally, right? Being sent is a result of the gospel message that saves you. It's a result of a you loving a God who loves people. It's a result of having passion for the one who has compassion for people. So you might feel it emotionally. I hope you do. That feels a lot better when you do. You might not. That doesn't matter. This is a message, not that we always love, but that we submit to. And God says, get up and go. And this is either something that we hear and ignore or we surrender to. There's this great commercial that was on the air a couple years ago. I think it was for cold medicine or something. It shows this woman who comes into a little girl's room. It's her daughter. And, and the mom, it's the mom. And she says, hey, Amanda, I'm sorry to bother you, but um, I've got to take a sick day. I can't be your mom today. I'm not feeling so good. And, and that's ridiculous, right? Any, anybody who, anybody who's, who's been the parent of kid, like children, you, know, you don't get to call in sick. You don't get to say, like, I'm sorry, like, I'm just not feeling it right now. Can you just take care of yourself for a while? Like, you know, play amongst yourselves, and I'll get back to you when I'm feeling it again. You don't get to do that. And if you've been born again as a follower of Jesus, if you've accepted the spirit of adoption to call God your father, you don't get to hang it up on days you don't feel it. You are his child. Your role on this earth, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, your role is to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. If Jesus is your savior, this is the, this is the message that we carry. And if you want to see revival in your life, and if you want to see the revival in the life of those around you, this is the message to which you surrender. Go to them. So often we're standing on the outside of the city trying to speak the truth into the city and God saying, go in. I can't reiterate that enough, Christian. You will never be more sent than you are already. We've got to get up. We've got to go to people. There's one more thing that God says to Jonah. One more instruction, actually, one more message that he gives to Jonah that I would say, this is a message you and I, if we want to sow the seeds of revival, this is a message we surrender to. Get up. Go to the people. Last one, God tells him, preach the words that I give you. In other words, you're going not equipped with your own truth, right, but with God's. So Jonah's going to Nineveh. He's going to preach, but he's not going to share his own words. He doesn't have to come up with what to say. The message is not his. He's just carrying it. Now, for some of us, that might seem comforting. Like, if you're a person who's not really um, good at talking, we'll say, if you feel like speaking in public or speaking in deep conversations is not really your thing. Maybe this is encouraging. Oh, it doesn't rely on me. God's going to give me the words. And at some level, I think that is kind of encouraging until you see the words he gave Jonah. In 40 days, your city is going to be demolished. I mean, I want to like, critique the Lord, but I feel like I could have said it better. I'm joking. In 40, I mean, that's actually kind of rough. And there are some scholars that think like, yeah, there was probably more to his message than that. I don't know. But I'm going to take it at face value. I'm going to say this is what Scripture tells us he said. I'm going to assume that's what he said. He's walking through this city probably for three days, they think. It's about three times the size of Onuski. And so he's walking through this city saying, in 40 days, it's all going to be demolished. I mean, that's kind of tough. No mention of why the city is doomed. No mention that it's God's judgment. By the way, no mention of God at all. Huh. God said, give them the message that I give you to share. I would say, no, nah, this is an evangelism 101. I don't really get it. Next time you ask the Spirit for the right words to say, you better be ready for him to give you some pretty difficult messages. <laughs> I kind of doubt God will give you the same words he gave to Jonah. 
But I suspect, and listen to this, because you're like, well, I'm never going to have to say stuff like that. Probably. Probably. But I suspect he'll give you equally uncomfortable words to share in different conversations. If you and I are going to share the message that God gives you to share, I suspect it will also be uncomfortable. Maybe prompting you to share hope with somebody who doesn't seem ready to feel hopeful. Maybe sharing truth with somebody who, who seems blind to it. Maybe showing mercy when you'd rather just show vengeance. I don't know. I don't know what the Lord will prompt you to say, but what I can say is that when we dare to surrender to the message we've been given, God's words will have their effect. He told everyone that they were doomed. And I don't, this doesn't really fit into a like, framework of a convincing argument to me. It's an uncomfortable message. And what happens when it's shared? The entire city, it says, believed in God. The message Jonah shared was effective. It wasn't effective because Jonah was such a great speaker. It wasn't effective because it was such an airtight argument that no one could argue with him, right? It wasn't effective because he had all the answers. It was effective because it was the message God had given. God's words are not powerful because we happen to like them. They're powerful because they come from a powerful source. One of the ways the road is paved for revival is when the messengers of God submit themselves to the message of God. And when the truth that is in your mind begins to take hold of your heart and your life and you speak it out into the world around you. Get up. He says, go and share the truth that you've been given. That's when revival, and that's when new life are ignited within us. This is the first take home for us. When we talk about revival in Jonah, this is for you and for me. When you say, like, what's the application here? How can I, how can I take this scripture and, and write it directly into my life? That's right here, right here. Are you ready? Messengers, surrender to the message. Dare to believe in your life that you have been relieved of shame. Dare to believe that Jesus has paid the price for your sin. Dare to believe that the words of God are powerful and true and they'll make a difference in the lives of those around you. Dare to get up and go into the world and share the truth of God's good news. That's, this is the role you and I play in revival. The most incredible act of revival power any person can exhibit is to surrender to the message of Jesus. Yeah, we got time for one more. I got one more. Uh, one more observation I want to share with you from this passage about revival. It's kind of a second big picture uh, take home. And I see it in this, in this passage we just read. The second big picture take home is this, that revival, revival comes after death. Revival comes, it comes after death. It doesn't come out of, by the way, loud music. Revival doesn't come out of an emotional service. It doesn't even come after a moving sermon. So quit waiting for this one to be one. You just read what I like, objectively would consider to be the worst sermon in the whole Bible in Jonah chapter 3. And it ignites this massive, one of the first massive revivals in Scripture. The message of God led people to the most important decision there. It led them in the most important direction there. And it wasn't into feeling better. It wasn't into some kind of profound, mystical, emotional experience, although it sounded pretty emotional. It wasn't into religious ecstasy either. God used Jonah to deliver a message. And where did the words lead them? Straight into repentance. Repentance. Straight into realizing that whatever hope they had in their lives was ending in death. Straight into realizing that whatever future they were looking forward to was going to end with death. <laughs> Straight into realizing that whatever plans they had, those plans did not outlast death. God used Jonah to show these people the road they were walking was a road towards death. So they chose to walk in a new direction. 
The road you're on is going to lead to death. So they chose to walk in a different direction. They chose, that's actually, that's what repentance is, isn't it? It's choosing to go in a different direction. I'm going to turn around and stop going the way I was going. I don't want to walk on that road anymore. I'm going to turn and walk this way instead. My friends, this is often the beginning of revival in our lives and the beginning of revival in a community. Do you want a journey toward new life? Well, the beginning of a walk towards new life means leaving the old one in the grave. Turning away from what was leading to death in order to turn to life. Revival comes, but it comes after a death. This picture occurs to me. It's an image from Scripture, and one I'm sure you're familiar with. Jesus approaches a temple, a place of worship, uh, an, an analogous to a church, if you will. Uh, he approaches a temple, and when he comes up to it, he sees these uh, tables out front, and these were pe- the places where people were selling kind of religious trinkets. Um, you could imagine, you could imagine like selling like books or bookmarks. I don't know. What do you sell in churches? Candles? I don't know. Anyway, you got a table. It's what do you sell in churches, Ollie? Bibles. Bibles. <laughs> you could imagine. Like, you have these tables out here, and this was a religious practice of the day. You have these tables out here, and they have these trinkets. They have animals for sacrifice. They're all out there selling these things. This is how they practiced religion at the time. And Jesus approaches this temple, and he sees these displays, these people uh, practicing faith the way they did, gathering the way they did. And he comes, and what does he do? He flips them over. Everything that's there is scattered on the ground. Well, this is a revival message. Revival doesn't begin with filling seats in church. It begins with flipping the tables in our hearts. And what was being held as holy, what was occupying a place where God should have been, being overturned, being surrendered and abandoned. When we realize we've been worshiping and celebrating and hoping in the wrong things and that it's time to, to, to flip the tables over and turn away from that old life and let it go and begin to walk in a new direction. Carl, a guy named Carl Bart, who had probably the least friendly Starbucks name uh, in history because it's Carl with a K and Bart with an H. Where do you suppose the H goes? Yeah, it's Carl Barth. He said this. He said it in German, but it works in English. He said, only where there are graves is there resurrection. He's quoting a guy named Nietzsche there, but we'll we'll credit it to Bart. You can only be revived when you realize your path, the path that you're walking is leading towards death. Is leading you deeper and deeper into despair and a sense of hopelessness and, and purposelessness. There's no shame, by the way, in that realization. In fact, that's the first step away from shame, is realizing I've been walking on a, a path that only leads to death. There's no shame in that. That's the first step away from shame. A journey that is not led by Jesus is not leading to hope. It's not leading to salvation. And revival can only happen in your life when you begin to accept Jesus' leadership and begin to follow him. You can't wait to be sure of it. It's always going to be a decision of trust. You can't wait to be comfortable with it. It's always going to be letting go of of what once was precious, what might need to die in order for you to live. That's how revival starts. Revival comes, but only after a death. Now I want to say this is not a checklist for revival. It's not a to-do list. But this is what we see in this moment of history here, that hearts become open for revival when this is their attitude, when messengers become servants of the message that they carry. When you and I, as as Christ followers, as, as members of a church, when we become servants of the message that we hear, and when what we hear takes hold of our hearts and starts to guide our very lives, that sows the seeds for revival. Revival. 
when the gospel becomes not just present but dominant in the lives of God's people and when people make the decision to let go of the old, to turn from the old pathways that were leading to yeah, frustration and to increasing desperation as your years go by, when we are, dare to let go and put to death the old, There's no shame in realizing the path you have been walking leads to death. There's no shame in realizing you've been going the wrong way. In fact, that realization is where hope begins. 